And today, uh, as we kick off the first turning, I thought it would be it'd be helpful to talk a little bit about the broader context that this early um, Buddhist tradition sits in, uh, which is uh, the context of the four turnings. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these four turnings very briefly with a special attention paid to the first turnings. So that's what we're exploring here for the next 10 weeks. And the purpose of this, yeah, really is just to give you a sense for the larger frame or the bigger picture in which this training is situated. Um, there's a quote that I ran across while watching a series on YouTube called Awakening from the Meaning Crisis by a professor in Canada named John Verveke. And in one of the uh, talks that he was giving, he described evolution uh, in a way that I really liked. And he said, evolution is revolution with change. So if you think about the simple revolution of say like a wheel, and, and this is the primary metaphor we're using here in the turnings uh, of the wheel of Dharma. Um, the first turning of the wheel happened when the Buddha uh, awakened and then began to teach. And as the tradition has changed and evolved over thousands of years, mm -hmm. There have been multiple revolutions, you could say, of these teachings, ways in which the teachings have changed. Um, but those changes aren't just like a kind of linear change in which you can see it goes from A to B. Rather, there's a change in which there's a kind of returning or coming back to what's most essential, a revolution, revolving, circular, recursive kind of movement. And at the same time, there's change each time we come back around to looking at like, what is the core of this tradition? What is this about? People uh, as part of this living lineage have been asking that question and they have found new answers, but those new answers are very much connected to the original, you know, uh, teachings and the original ideas that animated and began this tradition to be, to begin with. So evolution is revolution with change. We're looking here at the evolution of Buddha Dharma. That's what we're kind of exploring. That's the context of this training with a special focus on the first turning, the, the early Buddhist tradition, as it's often described, or sometimes it's called in Sanskrit, the Sutra Yana tradition. Yana just means vehicle. And Sutra here is a description of the Buddha's words as they're recorded, a sutra. So the sutra yana is the vehicle uh, of the Buddha's original teachings. It was started by Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha. And he, in the 5th or 6th century BCE, depending on, you know, we don't really know exactly, in South Asia, in the northern part of what is now India and Nepal, this person had a, a profound experience that we sometimes call awakening, had an awakening experience. Buddha literally means awake or awakened one. And uh, after this awakening, the Buddha spent several weeks sort of just chilling out in the awakened state. And in a sense, didn't think there was anyone that m would actually get this. So you could say he had a little period of like enlightened arrogance, which he thought no one could possibly understand this because it's so profound and I'm the only one, you know? Um, I like to think of it that way because it, it humanizes the Buddha, right? It's like, oh yeah, he was a human too, even though he had this profound experience uh, of awakening. But at some point he realized, well, actually, I think there are people that might be able to get this and moved kind of by compassion of wanting to share um, what he had realized and how profoundly it transformed his understanding of himself and reality. He went and searched out these folks. These were some former um, compatriots of his colleagues who he spent training for many years in an ascetic path, which he realized later didn't actually work to bring about the kind of awakening that he was seeking. He found these fellow mendicants, contemplatives, hanging out in the deer park 
where they used to practice together, now known as Saranath near Varanasi, India. And he taught them the Four Noble Truths. This is the first teaching of the Buddha. I think that's important to note. The first thing that he thought would help others awaken or realize what he realized was this formulation that we'll get more deeply into here in the first turning. He also taught on over the course of his lifetime, he spent, I think, something like 40 plus years teaching. He taught on dependent arising, on what are called the five aggregates, the sense fields, describing the different sensory fields of experience. He taught on not self, which is a pretty revolutionary teaching at the time. Um, because in India, most of the popular spiritual traditions were talking about the self, realizing the self. And he talked about the not self instead. He taught on the 37 aids to awakening, and he taught all the basic Buddhist teachings that are common now to all of the various Buddhist traditions that can be found in what are called the Sutra Pitaka and Vinaya collections, these collections of texts, the sutras and the Vinaya. The Vinaya is like the code for monastics. And I think it's important to recognize here that, yes, this is a monastic tradition. Um, it continues, actually. It didn't die out. It continued to evolve and change even as other new revolutions occurred. And if you want to find it in contemporary times, you can look to Southeast Asia and that what's called the Theravada tradition, the path of the elders, as it's translated into English. And I think of this very much as like the conservative Buddhists. These are the folks who are trying to conserve the original Buddhist tradition. You might think conservative could be to you a bad word, or it could be a good word, but I want to take it outside of like a political context and just say some people like to keep what's good about the past alive. These are the conservers. Some people like to adapt and change things. These are the adapters. Jack Kornfield once said, you know, all of us here in this room or at some point conservers or adapters, you know, he's talking in terms of Buddhist past, li past lives here. And here we are back again, you know, doing our conserving and adapting. This was at a Buddhist geeks conference that he said this. So I guess he assumed everyone would be fine with that frame. Whether or not you believe in past lives, here we are, we have these tendencies to conserve or adapt. And this is a tradition that's tried to conserve the original uh, lifestyle and practice and teachings of the Buddha. It's most alive in Southeast Asia, as I said, but it came to America and to the West in, in, in the last hundred years, really, as insight meditation. Uh, we learned, uh, Emily and I, about this tradition through the early American uh, teachers, jo Joseph Goldstein, Jack Kornfield, and Sharon Salzberg, who spent their teens and 20s practicing in Asia with teachers in India and Thailand and Burma. And they brought back what they had learned and began to teach that here in America with the support encouragement of their teachers. The two main traditions that I wanna just mention that have really informed our view of the first turning and that Emily and I are authorized Dharma teachers in are the tradition one of Mahasi Sayadaw, a monk in Burma, a former monk, he's no longer alive whose teacher was named Ledi Sayadaw. And this is a tradition that's most associated for those of you that are familiar with the noting meditation method. So this is one stream of kind of uh, monastic practice that we learned as lay meditators. And what's interesting, kind of you go deep into the background of this, these, lay, these Buddhist monastics began teaching uh, lay people really in the 20th century as a way to preserve, to conserve their own tradition in the face of British colonialism. There's a great book called The Birth of Insight by Eric Braun that kind of details the history of this. But in a way, this is again, the conservative movement of Buddhism attempting to, to keep what is good and awesome about its tradition alive. And it does that through adapting, interestingly enough, through sharing the teachings more broadly with lay people and inviting more people to come and experience deep states of meditation on retreat that were usually only reserved for monks. The other tradition I want to mention that's really informing our view here of the first turning comes out of the Thai forest tradition uh, from a teacher named Ajahn Chah. 
Ajahn Chah was one of Jack Cornfield's teachers, and Emily and I studied with Jack very closely at Spirit Rock. And Ajahn Chah was like the Buddha, uh, a wandering monk in the jungles of Thailand. He tried to live this lifestyle. The Thai forest tradition, in a sense, was a throwback to the extreme aestheticism of early Buddhism. Uh, and Ajahn Chah was also a very different kind of teacher than Mahasi Sayada. The way that he taught the Dharma was very uh, less technical focus and technique heavy and more open and spacious in terms of how he, uh, how he taught. I was reading uh, several years ago uh, the work of Reggie Ray, who's a third turning teacher uh, in the lineage of Chagyam Trungpa. And I remember him saying that when he first was encountered Ajahn Chah's teachings, he thought, oh my gosh, this guy is a Dzogchen teacher. Dzogchen is a, is a, is a tradition in, in the Tibetan system in which you just point directly to awareness or what they call Rigpa. And you just sort of be there. You just be at the completion of the path. And Ajahn Chah was like that. He taught this direct pointing to what he called the one who knows. He said, just rest as the one who knows and just be aware. It's that simple. Whereas Mahasi was like, okay, learn this technique and go through these stages and dissolve your ego into, you know, emptiness. And then have these experiences that are kind of a, on a progressive map of awakening. So here we have two very different traditions within the same tradition of the first turning. And we'll kind of explore that as we go deeper. So the first turning is alive today, but in the history of the Buddhist tradition and the evolution of Buddhism, there was a, you could say a revolution that happened several hundred years after the time of the Buddha. This revolution is said to have happened on what's called Vulture Peak Mountain. And this is kind of a mythical story, you could say, of the Buddha teaching a new set of teachings or emphasizing a new thing, uh, which isn't something new in, in fact, but it was, it was already present in the early tradition, but it wasn't as central. And that was the teachings on emptiness and on what he called the Bodhisattva path the path of the Bodhisattva. This is most likely to have occurred this sort of revolution in the early Buddhist tradition uh, between 100 BCE and 150 CE, if you want to get a sense for when these Mahayana Buddhist teachings were really kind of coming about the most period of most creativity. And there's another person who I want to mention here who was associated with these teachings, but who's kind of also like a mythical figure. We don't really know a lot about them historically. Uh, a monk named Nagarjuna. And Nagarjuna, uh, there's several surviving texts from this uh, Buddhist monk on what, what's called, what he called the middle way. Of course, the middle way is something that already existed, but he brought some new sophistication to how he described the middle way and how he described emptiness. And one of the most profound things that Nagarjuna taught was a kind of Buddhist non-duality in which he said, Nirvana and samsara are not separate. They're not different from one another. There's no distinction between them, in fact. Whereas in the early Buddhist tradition, there was in fact a distinction between Nirvana and samsara. You're caught in samsara, the cycle of rebirth, and you wanna get out into Nirvana which is a kind of radical, uh, unconditioned freedom. And there's a sense in which there's a path from samsara to nirvana in which you escape the, ba the, the bonds of samsara and you are liberated, you're free. But here, Nagarjuna, and this is really kind of one of the key points of the second turning, points out that there is no fundamental separation between nirvana and samsara. These aren't two different things. They don't exist in a dual, dualism. But in fact, they're one thing. And it, emptiness isn't the recognition simply that, that there's no permanence to experience or to yourself, that there's a not a permanent self. Rather, emptiness is understood as a lack of independent self-existence, that you don't exist independently of anything else. 
And here, we, this is where the bodhisattva path becomes central. Because if you understand emptiness as a lack of independent self-existence, that is interdependence or interbeing, as Thich Nhat Hanh said, existence means coexistence. To be is to interbe. Then suddenly awakening isn't so much about your own freedom and own liberation. It's about the liberation of all beings because we're all inter are. We all are in this together. Thus the ideal of the second turning becomes the bodhisattva not the, as in the first turning, the arhat, the perfectly enlightened one. Rather, it's the bodhisattva, the one who puts off their final enlightenment to help all beings because they recognize there is no final enlightenment independent of all beings. So this is the second turning. And then several hundred years later in the fourth century CE, again in Northern India, there's yet another revolution or you could say refinement uh, of the of the teachings of of early the Mahayana tradition, in which these uh, two figures in, in particular are very important. They're half brothers named Asanga and Vasubandhu, and there are a number of texts, both that they wrote and others who were uh, inspired by them wrote, that became the basis for what's called the third turning. And here, what's really, I just want to highlight in brief, you know, some of the key teachings of the third turning, including the teachings on Buddha nature. So uh, this understanding that some part of us is already, always already purely awake, that we don't have to do anything to cause that to be. And instead of the emphasis on the teachings of emptiness, which were often a kind of negation you know, if you read the Heart Sutra, which is one of these early uh, second turning texts from the Prajna Paramita, uh, it's really pointing out that like all of these concepts, you know, the Four Noble Truths and all these lists, all these different conceptual frameworks that the early Buddhism had put forth, none of those are it. You know, all of those concepts are also empty of inherent independent existence. But here in the third turning, there's a kind of move back to pointing out something that is more inherent, you could say or primordial would probably be the better word. Something that's always already the case. Our Buddha nature, and here they also in the third turning talk about the eight consciousnesses. This is a map that describes these different layers of consciousness. And the, the, the eighth level of consciousness is what they call the storehouse consciousness. This is where all of the other things arise from, the alia vishnana, as it's called in Sanskrit. And so they have new maps and models to describe how it is that Buddha nature can be and how it works that we become deluded, you know, and are, are confused about our basic nature, even though it's pure as it as 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 uh, the day we were born. There's also teachings in the third turning on what are called the three natures. Um, these are some of the key kind of third turning teachings, which become the basis for the entire Vajrayana Buddhist tradition of Tibet. Uh, which is, you know, spent, now, now we can imagine these teachings go from Northern India into Tibet and they incubate there for like a thousand years. And think about all the other amazing things that come out of that. At the same time, um, as Buddhism continues to evolve and go to Tibet and over into East Asia, at some point as the world changes, and especially as there is this kind of revolutionary moment in the West and in Europe called the, the Western Enlightenment. We get what we could call the fourth turning. This is a theory that was put forward by my mentor, uh, Ken Wilbur, an integral philosopher who we met in Boulder, Colorado, while we were at Naropa. In fact, I moved to Boulder. I convinced Emily to help to, to move to Boulder with me in some sense, because I really wanted to meet Ken and to somehow find a way to study with him. So I went to Naropa, transferred there, and uh, ended up working for him for a number of years uh, at his Integral Institute. And there I learned about this idea of the fourth turning, and, and, and more or less what it is in a nutshell is the coming together of the Eastern Enlightenment with the Western Enlightenment. When these two collide in the modern era, starting in the late 17th century, 
in the early 18th century, especially in France, but kind of all across Europe, you get this sort of combination of these early Western Enlightenment thinkers like David Hume and Immanuel Kant, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Adam Smith and Voltaire, many others, who had started to kind of come up with these basic ideas of, of universal, universal human rights um, that served as the under, underlying ideas that animated Western modern democracies and the capitalist uh, economies. Now I know because we're living in the later stages of, of modern times, what we could call post-modernity or some call meta-modernity that we've now become aware of the downsides, right? Of the modern era as well. So I wanna also just kind of recognize that part of this modern breakthrough in thinking and in science and in technology and in medicine also came with a huge shadow side. It came with Western colonialism of using these advanced science and technologies to colonize other people and lands. Um, being part Palestinian myself, you know, I'm both uh, on both sides of this historic. My ancestors are on both sides of this split. So I kind of uh, have this sense of kind of being between both worlds, being both the colonizer and the colonized, you could say. And so it's not all peachy and it's not all good, you know, uh, in, indeed we can point to the, to the ecological crisis, the climate crisis that we're living through right now and say, this is an unintended effect of these powerful modern technologies that we're able to burn so much dead dinosaur mass that we've actually shifted the entire ecology that we all depend on. And yet part of what occurred in this kind of revolution of the Western enlightenment was a kind of, a kind of liberation of thinking in which authority no longer rested in the institutions of religion. In fact, it shifted, it was distributed more to the individuals, to people. And there's a breaking down of these institutions and unbundling of all of the human institutions and the ideas within them and a kind of way in which they all met in the open marketplace of ideas. And this is what we get with the fourth turning is this sort of coming together or meeting of these different traditions. And that includes all of the Buddhist traditions that have evolved up to this point. One thing that Ken Wilber described with a fourth turning, he said it, it, any legitimate fourth turning tradition would recognize at least four things. And I want to just briefly mention those. One is it would recognize the, the historical legacy of waking up of the awakening tradition. That's so central in all of the Buddhist schools and all the turnings that have come before. It would also recognize though, the necessity of cleaning up that we can't just awaken uh, and get rid of all of our issues. There's a kind of mythological understanding of enlightenment where you awaken and then you're good. You know, you don't have to do anything else. <laughs> and, oh God, I wish that were true. <laughs> you know? uh, and yet, you know, I can say from my own experience of focusing a lot on awakening uh, and, and not focusing as much in the early days of practice on, um, on therapy or on the psychodynamic shadow, that it's not true. It's just not true. You can awaken and be as miserable of a fuck as, as, as when you started <laughs> because awakening isn't about, you know, necessarily changing the conditions of life, although hopefully that does happen, but it's rather about recognizing the, the suchness of, of, of conditional reality, the way it actually is. So here we can look to the Western psychotherapeutic tradition. So its own kind of wisdom tradition and learn from it, right? To the, the encountering of Western psychology and Eastern enlightenment uh, lead to this recognition that we can both clean up and grow up, that the Buddhist, Buddhist tradition didn't know everything about the psyche, that there's things we can learn from other traditions here about how to integrate what Jung called the shadow 
also in the Western tradition, you get the development of what's called developmental psychology. You know, many people are already familiar with Jean Piaget and his theories on child development, on how children develop through these cross-cultural stages of development, you know, go from these certain ways of, um, of understanding the world, concrete operational things are literally what they are. And that's all to post formal operations where you can imagine something as if it's something else. Um, you get this sort of very elegant theory of childhood development that seems to hold pretty well across different traditions, cultures. Uh, and then there's a recognition later on with, with uh, other developmental psychologists that this doesn't stop when we're like teenagers. We don't just stop developing. Some of us do. <laughs> Some people do actually stop, but it's possible to continue developing and maturing. And this is what Ken called growing up. So a fourth turning of Buddhism, he said, would include waking up, cleaning up, and growing up. That is the ability to mature our, our capacity to take different perspectives, to take more perspectives, to have a more inclusive way of making sense of the world. And then finally, uh, Ken talked about the importance of showing up, that a fourth turning would include teachings on showing up, on being your authentic, unique self, that we don't have to simply negate the self as in with awakening. We can recognize that's one truth. It's true that we're not this independent self that exists, but on another, from another perspective, we also are this unique coming together of causes and conditions that is only happening right here and right now. And we are uniquely who we are. And there's a way that we can express that and be that more fully. And that's the kind of perspective of showing up. So this is one way of describing what the fourth turning looks like, is that it includes all of these perspectives, waking up, cleaning up, growing up, and showing up. And it doesn't conflate or confuse each of them. It doesn't say you can just bypass and be okay by awakening. Everything else will take care of itself. Or you can just do your psychodynamic work and then everything will be fine and you'll have no other issues, you know, uh, or you can just, you know, go out into the world and express yourself and do your unique work in the world and be, you know, do be whoever you're meant to be. And then everything will be fine. Or you can just focus on developing yourself and, and being like this sort of, uh, you know, like philosopher who like is able to integrate all these perspectives, like my mentor, Ken Wilber, and everything will be fine. No. Like all of these things are important and they're all something to consider as we have now encountered all of these different traditions and perspectives and no longer can ignore that they represent valid truths. I mean, we can ignore them, but at our own peril. So this is the larger context in which we are exploring these first turning or early Buddhist teachings. Uh, we won't be zoomed out to the, all this foreturning thing for the whole time that we're here, but we will touch back in with this larger perspective because it kind of serves as the basis for this entire cycle of training um, that we're engaged in here through Buddhist Geeks. <laughs>